Hello world, good morning. Today I have the privilege to talk with Dr. Robin Alders from Australia. My name is Christina Kren, a social media intern for One Health Lessons. Good morning, uh, Dr. Alders, how are you doing today? I'm fine, good morning to you and thanks so much for getting in touch. Um, you're welcome and thank you for finding time for recording this interview as well. Um, could you please uh, briefly uh, present yourself and tell us more a little bit more about your academic and professional background? Thanks. I, I was born and raised on a grazing property, a grazing um, sheep and beef farm in, in Australia. I studied veterinary science at the University of Sydney and went on to do a, a PhD in veterinary immunology at the Australian National University. However, at the end of my studies, I, I decided that really clinical work was not where my interest lay. Uh, and uh, over my time at university, I had become very interested in international development. So my first job after um, completing my PhD was at the University of Zambia, where I taught um, for, for three years, and that was a wonderful experience. Um, from there, I, I've gone on to work at universities. I've worked for non-governmental organizations. I've worked con for consulting firms and consulted to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations and the International Fund for Agricultural Development. Um, I'm currently an honorary professor with the Development Policy Center at the Australian National University and a senior consulting fellow with the Global Health Program at Chatham House in the UK. All right, uh, impressive uh, information. Thank you for sharing all of this. And uh, it, it, it is very interesting that you have worked in many countries uh, during uh, your lifetime career. I don't know how you were doing it, you know, at the same time being away from Australia and then living in Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe uh, sorry, Zambia, and then um, um, uh, collab uh, moving to the UK, I suppose, right? Um, I, actually, I, I consult uh, with Chatham House, but, but I'm not based there. My right. outside Australia, the place where I've lived the longest is in Mozambique. Exactly. I also had uh, three years uh, living in Massachusetts while I worked at Tufts University, involved with their international veterinary medicine program. And that's how I got to, to know Deborah Thompson. Excellent. Uh, and uh, so regarding the UK, you are working, uh, you're collaborating uh, with them from Australia. Um, yes. Yeah. Excellent. Um, uh, recently, you have uh, done a TEDx talk, and um, um, if you can eventually tell us a little bit more about uh, your experience with TEDx talk, how how was the feeling to talk in front of uh, students and adults who perhaps never heard of the um, of the uh, of veterinary medicine in terms of uh, research? And eventually, later on, we can mention the term One Health. OK, thanks very much. The um, TEDx talk was organized by postgraduate students at the Australian National University. Uh, it was a very exciting event for me because for six months, we'd all more or less been in lockdown because of COVID-19. So the, uh, the talk in October was my first chance to, to be in front of an audience after several months. My, my talk didn't really focus on veterinary medicine. The, the title of the talk was Eating for the Future. So it was really focused on sustainable diets. There's, and it's in response to the concern that we're seeing globally around the role of agriculture in greenhouse gas emissions. And often that discussion um, takes place um, in isolation from understanding um, the human body and human nutritional physiology. And one thing that I've found my training as a veterinarian has been very helpful because it provided me with an approach to comparing different species. So when you study vet science, 
you study many different animal species, you look at their anatomy, you look at their nutritional physiology. And so that helps me to, to think a little bit about humans, about what our uh, gastrointestinal tract is like and what that means for our nutritional physiology and how we can think about um, nourishing humans in a very efficient way that also makes us healthy. So uh, it, it, the, the talk is under 12 minutes. So if people have time, please, it's, it's posted up on YouTube. Um, and uh, I welcome your feedback on it. Thank sure, you. Uh, we will share the link of your uh, TEDx talk uh, um, under the uh, under the description part. It is going to be, the link is going to be present in the description box uh, on YouTube below this video uh, interview. Um, and, uh, yes, and uh, actually. Um, I'm curious to know what is the future of vet, uh, of veterinary veterinary medicine and uh, sustainability in uh, in Australia. So that's a, that's an excellent question, and I think it's a question um, that faces the veterinary profession worldwide. And we are dealing with multiple challenges or existential threats. As a profession, we need to respond to and contribute to mitigating climate change. We need to look at issues around sustainable development and competition for resources. So currently with 7 billion, over 7 billion people, um, it's not only the people that are consuming resources, it's also the domestic animals that we choose to raise. So today we have more domestic animals than ever before both animals that are used to provide food for animals, but also our companion animals. And those companion animals are frequently dogs and cats that have very strict nutritional requirements. So meeting the needs of those animals also contributes um, to the, the burden that we are placing on our planet. So I think as a profession, we really need to stop and think not only about looking at the health of individual animals, but looking at the health of all animals, including wildlife and the natural world where they live. So I think our profession does need to reconsider. Uh, clearly, most vets in Australia work in small animal practice. Very few vets work in relation to farms. Um, and I think that there's a it's a time for reflection. Uh, in Australia, we have a group called Veterinarians for Climate Action. They're trying to raise the issue of the need to deal with climate change. Many people will have been aware of the horrendous bushfires, the wildfires that occurred in Australia uh, around one, one year ago now. And uh, millions of animals, particularly wild animals, were killed um, during that event. And so it's help it, the, this organization, Veterinarians for Climate Action, are encouraging vets to think about how we can uh, raise animals sustainably, but even down to running clinics. How can you run clinics um, in a, with zero? How can you aim to be carbon neutral um, in your clinical practice? As is happening in the UK, for instance, um, there is a, a move in the UK to have human medical services aim to be carbon neutral. And that's fabulous. I think many professions can, can aim to follow on that. So that, that's a, a very broad um, view. As I say, most vets in Australia work with small animals, but we do have vets who are intimately involved with caring for wildlife, um, doing research. The, the one thing about graduating as a vet is it allows you to follow many different paths after you graduate. Absolutely. And um, actually, uh, the same with the legal world. I'm studying law and often our professors are saying um, the law um, helps you um, or the law studies helps you out later on to specialize in any uh, field of expertise. And when we are a student at my age, we are not really um, sure or what shall we study for our master's and PhD degree and I believe so um, when is the question of veterinary medicine which is a very interesting field of expertise like 
um, when I think when when I was a child, I wanted once to be um, a veterinarian, but uh, basically for I was saying to my grandma, I would like to be a veterinarian for for lions. I, at the age of six, I was saying that, and I was saying, and then I when I grew up, I uh, my grandma remind, reminded me of that event that and and that words that I said. And I said, oh my goodness, to be a veterinarian for lions, that's super difficult. <laughs> it is. And it is a very, very uh, funny moment that I remember from my childhood, because nowadays uh, to be a veterinarian, it is uh, a very challenging job and requ requires uh, passion and dedication and motivation as well in order to succeed, to be able to understand uh, the structure and the life of many animals as well. Um, when we're speaking regarding the animal world, uh, perhaps can you please tell us now what is your opinion regarding the term One Health and what is the future of One Health? Thanks, that's a great question and I'd like to link my answer back to your profession, the legal profession. I think um, getting the legal framework, um, refining the legal framework so that it can support sustainable development is going to be crucial as we move forward. So I think having people like yourself involved and uh, reaching out to different professions will be very important. To me, I, I think One Health is a paradigm and it can mean different things to different people. It's, it was originally conceived as a very holistic view of um, that interconnectedness of everything. Um, more, it, it, during the days of avian influenza, the bird flu outbreak of H5N1, it became very linked to zoonotic disease. So people spoke about One Health as something that linked anim animals, humans, and the environment. As we move forward and as we think about that crucial role, um, particularly of food systems in, in the health of our planet, I think, uh, and the way I like to, to think about One Health really is breaking it down to the different components that we need to think about if we're going to achieve a healthy planet. So it is thinking about people, but people are part of the environment. And the environment has been in many places quite altered by our activities, including agriculture. So we need to think about soil health, the health of water, the health of plants, um, the health of people and, uh, and the health of, of animals. So I see One Health as a very broad concept that helps us to take a systems approach to solving problems and to coming up with frameworks and legal frameworks that will support um, development that is good for people and good for the planet. And one area where I think um, getting the legal framework um, um, refined is going to be very important in relation to trade and, and food and circular economies. So there's a lot of talk now about circular economies, trying to have a more sustainable approach to the way we do economics. People are talking about circular food economies. And for that to work, we're, we're absolutely going to need legal frameworks that encourage us to do the right thing and reward uh, those who do the right thing. So I think it's a really exciting time, but clearly there's no time to lose. Absolutely. And definitely um, in the region where I'm living, we always uh, basically talk about global health and public health, but not really about the importance of One Health. And um, definitely there is an interdependence between um, um, uh, human health, animal health, and, and, and environmental health. So definitely we should be aware regarding the uh, promotion, the, the indispensable promotion of uh, One Health as a notion. And I truly hope that this interview will inspire many young people to take into consideration the importance of One Health as an approach. Uh, Dr. Alders, thank you very much for your time today. Um, I am I am really saddened uh, regarding the uh, bush fires uh, event that occurred in Australia last year. Um, definitely, uh, in the nature, everything is um, unpredictable, and therefore, um, for such unpredictability, it uh, it can happen 
uh, we should be, uh, no, I mean, regarding that um, um, a sense of unpredictability, we should be uh, having some, um, of, or having some sense of preparedness, because for instance, uh, for now I'm living in a region like Istanbul, where uh, actually we are expecting a big earthquake to happen soon, a really big earthquake, but we don't know when, and the scientists are conducting various research and uh, um, uh, studies, and um, in order to um, inform the general audience that uh, sooner or later um, um, an earthquake will occur, but we should get prepared in advance in order to avoid a casualties. Um, and um, definitely when the um, bash fires occurred in Australia, all the world was trying to help out. And um, I think that this is a perfect example how um, the importance of one health is uh, primordial, like uh, in terms of uh, pr the preservation of the environment. The nature uh, cannot without us, and we, we cannot live without the nature, actually. So we are, this is the independence that I am talking about. Um, yes, this is basically what I would I wanted to share. I would like to thank you uh, uh, a lot for your time for this interview and uh, wish you all the best with your professional uh, and uh, veterinary work. Thanks so much. And thanks so much for your commitment to One Health and for providing your time and your expertise to bring this, these, this series of interviews together. Thank you. And I really look forward to watching your other interviews. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much as well. And have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.